uh, anyway, I appreciate that introduction. Uh, <clears throat> good to see everybody here. Uh, as Tom mentioned, I'm an instructional designer at the University of North Florida, uh, also a, an adjunct faculty member in the ed tech department here at the school. Um, and also just to give you, he also mentioned my K-12 experience, just to give you a little bit of my backstory. Uh, in, in the early days of my professional experience before shifting over into higher ed, I was a high school English uh, and AP Lit teacher uh, here in Duval County Public Schools. And I only share that with you now because uh, I make reference to this a handful of times uh, throughout the presentation. Uh, but with, with that being said, let's let's go ahead and jump in. Uh, so in this workshop, our goals for the workshop, what I hope you're able to take away by the end of our time here today is that you'll be able to identify the characteristics of discussion board prompts that support deep learning, knowledge construction, and sustained dis discussion, but also to be able to create your own discussion prompts that generate deep, a deep learning, knowledge construction, and sustained discussion. So in other words, our goal is that you can recognize good discussion prompts and also develop your own within your specific discipline. Excuse me, sorry. So before, before we get into the meat of this content, I wanted, I wanted to begin by taking a step back and asking this question or dealing with this question, like what is the goal or purpose of a discussion activity? Right, in other words, why would an instructor want to use a discussion board activity as opposed to a traditional class assignment, right? And I, I know of several professors who wanna get rid of or who have gotten rid of the discussion board altogether in their online courses. And I guess I wanna reflect for a moment of, of, about why we do this thing in the first place, right? I, I, I mentioned before that early in my educational career, um, I was a high school English AP Lit teacher. And in, and in a face-to-face -face setting, I love a good discussion. Right. So, some of my favorite moments teaching high school were when we would engage in deep and meaningful class conversation or a, or a Socratic seminar about a good book and, and, and what, what that book means and how it affects us. And, and I, I also think about this phenomenon from, from having taken part in a really good book club before and, and engaging conversation about something that we're reading together that there is this dynamic that can happen where talking out our understanding can help me as a student and, and often as a teacher as well to process what I think about something and why I think it, right? And you may be familiar with the term that we refer to as social constructivism and social constructivism teaches that knowledge develops as a result of social interaction, right? That, that it is a shared rather than an individual experience. And if you take away social interaction and social constructivist learning from an online course, <laughs> that you're left with a course that feels a lot like a MOOC, right? And a, a massive open online course. Like if you've, if you've ever taken part in a MOOC before, you, you may know there's a decent amount of isolation for students in these learning environments, right? That I'm, that I'm out here on a silo left to digest content on my own. So, so to, to, to answer this question, right, about what's the goal or purpose of, uh, of an online, uh, of, of discussion activity is the social constructivist piece and to combat the tendency towards isolation of online learning, right? That it supports, it supports social constructivist learning and it combats student isolation. So before I move on here, I, I wanna draw some parallels between a, a discussion board and face-to-face -face discussion, since, since the goals are predominantly the same, right? When I, when I was a, a high school teacher and I worked on trying to get the momentum started around a class discussion, there were definitely moments when questions landed with crickets chirping, right? And, 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 and also there were other moments where as soon as the question's out of my mouth, the students have taken the conversation and run with it. Right. There's 20 hands from students in the air who want to chime in. And for me, in those moments, if I notice that this that a discussion is flat, it's not going anywhere. That's usually the product of the questions that I'm asking and not that students are just lazy or something. Right. And am I asking questions that are likely to sustain conversation 
and prompt student interest? And, and is it likely to have us to, to lead to some, having something to talk about? <clears throat> you know, for example, if I think about in a high school English, uh, English classroom question, summarize what you read uh, in chapter two of the book, 1984. That's, that's not likely to lead us to having some, something substantive to talk about. As soon as a question, uh, as soon as someone says the answer, it, it, it's out there and like, what more is there to say? So I wanna take a few moments to consider the details from, from a study that I consider to be pretty interesting. Uh, and the researchers behind the study investigated the relationship between the types of question prompts that were used in online discussions <clears throat> and the depth of critical thinking that each prompt was able to develop in participating students in this particular course that they were examining. Uh, and this is actually the full list of the types of prompt structures that they were looking at in this study. Uh, and I actually found this list to be rather insightful. Um, and I'm gonna go to the chat right now and I'm gonna drop, I actually made a handout for you. There's several pieces on here. Um, if you want to access this Google Doc, um, but I, I put this in a document that you have access to kind of beyond, beyond this, this training. I'm not going to read you the full list here. You can feel free to digest this at your leisure, but I did want to look at uh, a few of the, the question types in their description uh, just to give, give you a sense of the content that's here and kind of what this study was looking at exploring. So if I look, we look at uh, this first example, right, the playground prompt. A playground prompt uh, involves questions that require the interpretation or analysis of a specific aspect of the material uh, or playground for discussion. Right? Students are feel, feel, uh, free to discover and interpret the material. You can see if you if you have that if you're looking at that Google Doc handout, you can see uh, this example uh, there. Rather than read me read this out loud to you, I'm going to give you just a, a few seconds to read through the prompt yourself. I'll pause here, give you an opportunity to read. So again, the, the, the playground prompt here involves students being free to interpret one specific aspect of the material. Uh, and, and in this inst in this example, it's not focusing on the content as a whole, this entire chapter, but the specific quote from the reading about being a good listener, right? So this is this is one type of prompt uh, that they looked at in this study. Second type of prompt, the brainstorm prompt. These questions ask students to generate a number of conceivable ideas, viewpoints, or solutions. Uh, related to a specific issue. Students are free, are free to generate any or all ideas on the topic. Again, I'll give you a few seconds here, look over this, this uh, example. And we're gonna, we won't do this for all the, all the question types, just a few of them, but give you a few seconds to read through this brainstorm prompt. So in this, in this prompt, uh, the brainstorming comes in as students are tasked with coming up with a list, in this instance, of the benefits and dangers, right? They can't go to their textbook to find this answer. They're generating their own list of items themselves. And the last one of these uh, that I wanted to look at here in this list was the focal prompt. Uh, and this is questions related to a specific issue, require students to make a decision, or take a position and justify it. Students are asked to support one of several possible positions. This one might be might also be referred to as a debate prompt because they're taking a position, justifying their position. Uh, look, look at an example here. Just like before, I'll pause, give you an opportunity to look over this one. So ideally, what would result from this particular prompt is that students take a position on whether they think that the Myers-Briggs test would be beneficial or not beneficial 
for hiring new employees. And in, in the discussion, they defend that position in conversation with other students, some of whom might agree, others who disagree with them. Right, so, so this begs the question, like why are you sharing this study with us, right? What's, what's the point? And part of what we learn from this study is that it matters what an instructor's goal is when you choose a particular prompt type or prompt style to use. So for example, if the goal of online discussion is to facilitate higher levels of critical thinking, and actually before I put up the next slide, uh, I, I just wanna put this out there more for your own sort of thinking about this than anything else. I'm not asking you to say it out loud or put it in the chat or anything, but do you have any thoughts on which of the prompts that they include in this study might be best for critical thinking? So I'll give you a second to look, if you have that Google Doc pulled up, look over that list and just for your own sort of self-checking, what do you think might be a, a, a type of question prompt that's likely to facilitate higher levels of critical thinking? And I'll go ahead and put it up here that actually what this study found was that critical incident question types are the kind that work the best. Now, we didn't look at this one uh, in depth uh, in just looking over a few of those uh, those question types. Uh, but this is the case case study prompt. And in these uh, in these types of questions, it presents a scenario or case study and students are asked to propose solutions to the issues presented in the scenario or case study. So a second set of goals or a second sort of focus uh, uh, that came out of this, this research, that if the goal of online discussion is, to, is for students to exchange ideas, again, I won't ask you to say this out loud, but give you a second or two to, to think about and, uh, on that list, uh, which of these uh, prompt types you think might be the best at exchanging, having students exchange ideas. And I see some some uh, posting in the chat. I'll just say that absolutely focal prompts of what the study showed uh, work the best to have students exchange ideas. You remember, might remember the focal prompt is uh, the debate prompt where students are debating uh, one perspective or another. Uh, final, one, one additional thing that came out of this research is that the lowest level of thinking came from, drum roll, <laughs> uh, the brainstorm and general invitation questions. Uh, in the brainstorm we talked about earlier, where students are you know, brainstorming you know, ideas for, for, for the, uh, whatever the prompt is asking them for, general invitation uh, involves inviting a wide range of responses uh, within a broad topic in an open or unfocused discussion. You can see this, uh, this description here. This might include a prompt like, tell me what stood out to you the most from the textbook reading or from the module uh, videos this week, where it's just sort of a general broad invitation uh, to, to reflect on the content. Now, if you care, if you care to see it, this slide has uh, the full results from the study regarding the level of conversation uh, generated by each of the discussion prompts. Um, without getting too much in the weeds with talk on cognitive presence and the, the practical inquiry model here, I'll just mention that triggering and exploration are considered lower levels of engagement, uh, while integration and resolution are considered higher levels. Uh, you know, perhaps you can notice on these slides here what we just mentioned uh, about the critical incident, uh, that it is by far the best option at generating uh, resolution, the resolution stage, which is the highest level of cognitive presence, or noticing that general invitation is uh, pretty far and away one of the worst. Um, and I think this is, I, I, again, I don't want to unpack this uh, too much in looking at each of these numbers. I found this beneficial, these results of the study, just looking at sort of how these numbers uh, worked out. And I'll sort of, uh, you know, if you have access to these slides, you can always come back to this one and check it out later on. Uh, but but OK, so now what? Right. Perhaps we learned a few things from this study. But now what? And I, I want to see if we can pinpoint a few takeaways from this study and, and, and a few others like it to to connect it to our workshop objective related to discerning and writing good discussion questions. So. 
what do we know about what makes a good discussion question? Let's see if we can't hone in on a few qualities here. So the first quality or the first thing we might say here is that it's connected to the intended purpose uh, and learning objectives to be achieved. So I think Bloom's taxonomy, right? Uh, and this, this connects to a point we made earlier on about the results from this study, that uh, as you, as an instructional designer, if you're a faculty member, think about crafting and refining a discussion prompt, you want to consider uh, what the objectives are for the course and for the module. Right. Is is the objective at this point about cultivating deep levels of critical thinking and analysis? Maybe a critical incident or case study prompt is most appropriate here. Um, is is the objective more related to the exchange of ideas at this point in your course? Uh, maybe a focal prompt uh, would work best. Um, since we probably have quite a few instructional designers in this session, this is probably not a new insight to take your learning objectives into consideration uh, when considering or uh, when designing a learning assessment. Uh, but second point here about what makes a good discussion question is that it will push students to deepen their thinking and understanding by engaging in the discussion. And there's two parts of this statement here. The first part is that it, it pushes students to deepen their thinking and understanding but also that it generates engagement in the discussion. Um, I just want to mention here, there are, there are good questions that can, help that can help to trigger deep reflection, but aren't good at generating discussion. And there's nothing wrong with that. And that's, that's probably just left to your more traditional assignments, not to a discussion board, right? On, on that handout that I, that I provided, on that Google Doc um, with question types, uh, the analytic convergent questions would be, be a good example of this, right? And the definition of these questions is, is that they're ones that require analytic thought, but lead to a single correct answer. And those would probably best be left to a traditional assignment rather than a discussion board. Uh, and the third piece uh, that I want to point out here about what makes a good discussion question is that it promotes divergent rather than convergent thinking. And this is a really important point that I want you to take away from this training, this idea of divergent rather than convergent. Uh, we'll, we'll unpack this a little more in just a moment, but, but for now, I just want to delineate these two by saying that convergent is where I'm looking for students to converge on the right answer. And divergent prompts are those that encourage differences of opinion, or differences of perspective. So on the next slide, right, looking at the uh, convergent versus divergent here. Convergent questions, typically written lower order level, doesn't necessarily have to be the case, but it, it has one correct or best answer. Um, and I keep coming back to my experience, but when I was a high school English teacher, I would, I would often do just a simple Google search. Uh, to find discussion questions for the books we were reading in order to, to, to prep for our class discussion, to prep for our class conversation. And there are some really bad questions that I would find out there that I could pretty much guarantee are not going to lead to good conversation that people put out there and say, this is a good, good discussion question, right? Take, uh, take for example, um, discussion questions I found at one point uh, for the book of Mice and Men someone suggested a good discussion question. What kind act does Slim do for Lenny? Or describe George and Lenny's dream. Or what, what is the solution? What is Carlson's solution to the problem of Candy's dog? Th these are not discussion questions. These are convergent comprehension questions with one answer, right? If we think about divergent questions, those are questions that elicit higher order, differ differing responses promote deep thinking, and lead students to analyze and evaluate alternative answers. So if we, if we come back to the of mice and men example, questions that are more likely to lead to divergent responses might include a question like, was George's act to kill his friend morally justified? Why or why not? Right, and these, these divergent questions lead to differences of perspective, differences of opinion, and are often the best at generating meaningful engagement. So just to put up a few uh, examples of convergent versus divergent questions, convergent question, what's a common theme in this text? What happened as a result of the, those actions? 
What were the long-term consequences? What was the reason why this happened? Again, with each of these questions, there's really only one correct answer. And once the answer's out there, there's not much to talk about. There's no room for differences of perspective or differences of opinion. On the divergent side, some, some sort of generic sample questions. What, what different strategies could be used to solve this problem? What's another way of looking at this? Which side of the debate do you agree with the most? Or maybe a more specific question, how will COVID-19 change how we work in the future? Right? And again, in each of these questions, it encourages students to analyze and evaluate alternative answers. I will likely be better off by hearing what you have to say, even, even if I like my answer better. <laughs> right? And so if I'm working with a faculty member as an instructional designer, and they have a convergent question that they're wanting to use in a discussion prompt, I'm going to make one of two recommendations. One, they keep the question, but make it a traditional assignment submission rather than a discussion. Or two, keep the discussion format, but modify the question so that it promotes divergent responses. And Kelly, I see your question. And we are, that is, uh, I actually built that into the presentation based on seeing feedback beforehand. So we will get there momentarily uh, about the uh, grading criteria. So those two solutions. So I want to I want to hone in uh, but before we get to that point. I want to hone in on a few key takeaways from this information. So again, if I have an instructor who wants to keep the discussion format, but modify the question so that it promotes divergent responses, I'll offer sort of a top three strategies to consider based on everything that we've talked about so far. Based on it, based on what we learned from that initial study that we looked at, uh, based on the initial points about what constitutes a well designed. Uh, well-designed question, and considering the promotion of divergent rather than convergent thinking, I might sort of suggest having a top three list of discussion strategies, sort of tools to keep in your tool belt, if you will. And each of these have been shown to promote deep learning and critical thinking in discussion boards, right? They promote divergent thinking and are often good at encouraging discussion encouraging conversation. So I just want to briefly visit or revisit each of these one more time as we add this as an effective tool in our tool belt for discussion prompts. So the first strategy, the debate strategy, again, the debate prompt or debate strategy, what that is, is that requires students to make a, make a, 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 make a decision or take a position and justify it as they're asked to support one of several possible positions. So perhaps I have an instructor who has the following discussion prompt in their course that deals with classroom management, right? So the prompt that they currently have in their course says, what is the most significant insight that you took from the textbook reading this week on classroom management? How can you apply that learning in your own classroom? Now, this is, this is basically a general invitation prompt that we learned from that initial study is, is not very good at generating higher levels of discussion. So perhaps I reflect with the instructor to consider whether it would be appropriate to make some sort of revision to it where it becomes more of a debate prompt. Since this is one of the tools that I have in my discussion strategy tool belt of tools that I know work. So perhaps we consider a topic that gets at the heart of the objective in this module and is likely to generate differences of opinion from students. So you can see here, here's our revised, we're revising this prompt to be more of a debate strategy. So this, this prompt now reads, detention and in and out of school suspension are perhaps the most utilized tools for American management or for classroom management in American public schools. Should they be included in a teacher's approach to managing their classroom? Take and defend your position in the discussion conversation and include support from the reading to back up your argument. So now students have to pick a side and discuss whether they consider this to be an effective and appropriate approach to classroom management. But it still addresses the same general topic and objective as the original question. Right, so that first, the debate strategy, can we revise it, make it, make it into a debate structure? Second strategy here, the case study strategy. Now, maybe I reflect with the instructor and I decide that it maybe won't be appropriate to make some sort of revision uh, to make this more, as a, a, more into a debate prompt. Maybe there's no immediately apparent debate topic 
uh, on this course objective. Or maybe I just want some additional options here. So the case study, or also known as the critical incident prompt, this is the one that presents a scenario or a case study, and students are asked to propose solutions to the issues that are presented in the scenario or case study. So perhaps we consider this, 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 this uh, discussion prompt that we have and thinking about whether it would uh, work to adapt it into a case study format. So now here, this becomes after reading the attached case study, describing the scenario experienced by Mrs. Jones and her student, what steps would you take to address this management problem if you were the teacher? Now, obviously, uh, an example like this it would include an additional document of like actually describing the scenario. Maybe in this instance, it's providing a description of a teacher who's struggling with uh, classroom management uh, and describes the behaviors of a particular student in the class that she's dealing with. Um, in, in these instances, the responsibility would likely fall to the instructor uh, to either find or uh, or uh, to either find existing scenarios and case studies or to create their own uh, based on their understanding of problems of practice in their own field. Right. So this is another tool that we have. Can we revise our uh, our our discussion board that needs work into a case study format? And then finally, this last strategy, not so much a format for structuring the questions and more about structuring the conversation. And this is through the use of discussion roles. Um, I actually use these discussion roles in the Intro to Ed Tech course that I teach, where I randomly assign students to, to these roles for each discussion in the course. Um, I, I'll kind of pause here for a moment, give you an opportunity to look over these roles and their descriptions. Um, I don't want to read it to you, but give you a few seconds to sort of digest this, uh, the, see what's on this slide. Now, this is not an exhaustive list of roles that you might include, but there is ample data out there about the effects of assigning discussion roles like these on the depths of student engagement with online discussions. Uh, personally, I've been pleasantly surprised about students' ability to, to lean into these roles in my own course. Uh, and I included a description of these roles uh, along with the discussion types in that handout I provided in the Google Doc. So you can see the list. If you go to that Google Doc, it's like the second part of um, second part of that document where you can see each of these discussion roles. Um, so again, these are the three main discussion strategies that I'm encouraging you to consider adding to your tool belt based on everything we've learned about what research suggests works to generate deep learning and good conversation. And that's the debate strategy or debate prompt, uh, the case study prompt, and the use of discussion roles. And, and I see that the Google Doc, that was the one, uh, maybe Tom, if you can grab that Google Doc link and drop that. Uh, thank you, there we go, perfect. <clears throat> so I wanted to come back here. I had noticed in the questions and expectations for this workshop uh, that had been submitted um, when, when individuals registered that quite a few people mentioned a hope uh, that this session would include uh, sharing rubrics related to online discussion, right? We've already seen that in the, in the chat already. And, and in, in, I'm, what I'll share here is that in my, in my opinion, there's not a, a single silver bullet rubric to be used for all discussions, right? Depending on the preferences of the instructor uh, that you're working with, or if you are the instructor, depending on your preferences, if you are the instructor, there may be different qualities that you want students to focus on in their reflections, right? Some, some might be more concerned with uh, students offering substantive, insightful, and thoughtful, you know, and the thoughtful quality of the post. Um, others might want uh, to include elements about pulling in content from the readings and videos uh, into their post. Uh, some might place a higher level of concern on student interaction and, and the interaction piece uh, where students are re responding to one another. Uh, some might want all of these elements uh, captured in the rubric. Uh, and there's a study uh, by a guy named David Baker that actually suggests capturing both a qualitative 
and a qualitative element in the rubric. Um, this might include both identifying if the instructor instructor is looking for, you know, a well-constructed, thoughtful, independent comment, but also captures the expectation that it should consist of, you know, 125 words or more, 250 words or more, whatever the, the whatever those parameters are. Um, I will say personally, in a course I teach, my rubric has more points associated with the interactions and replies than the initial post, because I want students to focus on the interaction that they're having with each other. Um, and in my, in my experience, many discussion boards weigh heavier on the initial post. I personally wanted to emphasize the interactions. Um, I, I also spe I specifically capture in the rubric that these replies should occur on more than one visit. So in other words, um, if I want students to make three sub substantive replies to their peers and they're all done on the same day, I don't offer full credit because I want students to return to the conversation to respond to one another over multiple, you know, multiple times, multiple days. Um, and I wanted to, I'm going to drop in the chat here, uh, a resource that I find, I found really beneficial rather than me putting a bunch of stuff in the slides here, this resource, uh, it, 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 you can access several really good options for effective discussion rubrics. There's uh, some really good considerations about things to take in mind, keep in mind when you're developing a rubric. Um, and, and, and so it's, it's a resource that I think is, is useful, beneficial. It sort of takes into consideration what, you know, what you might be looking for and, you know, thinking about in your post. So I just sort of throw this out here as a good resource for those that put up those questions about looking for concrete things to use, uh, to think about grading and student feedback. Um, few final points here before we wrap up. I also wanted to mention uh, that in addition to considering the dynamics mentioned in this workshop about how to identify and craft discussion prompts that promote deep levels of engagement, that you might also combine this knowledge with several options for alternatives to text-based discussion boards, right? The first option, FLIP, many of you are probably familiar with, is a tool that can facilitate simple video discussions where students post videos of themselves uh, responding to whatever the instructor's prompt is. And I bring this up as, as an option where you can take what we know about what we've discussed about discussion boards in this, in this uh, workshop, and then rather than having students write it, instead having them talk it out, having them take, you know, use video discussions as a way to engage in these, uh, in these conversations. You could still integrate FLIP with a debate prompt or a case study prompt, or even discussion roles uh, as an alternative to traditional discussion board. Uh, finally, one additional tool I'll mention here, excuse me, uh, Perusal uh, is a tool where students can access an electronic version of a text. They, add, they can add annotations and comments within the text itself. Uh, and then interact and reply with uh, with others within the text itself, with other students in the class within the text itself. Now, you can't really integrate the types of prompts that we've been talking about today, like debate prompts or case study prompts, but it does provide an alternative way to encourage that social constructivist learning that we've been talking about. Uh, in, in this session, right? And reducing that social, social isolation that many online students tend to experience. I just throw that out there as an, another option for an alternative to a traditional discussion. Uh, finally, last point, last slide here that I wanted to mention. Also at the end of that Google Doc uh, that I uh, provided in the handout, uh, there is a graphic organizer tool that I developed that might be beneficial for either working with an instructor, or if you're the instructor, the, if you are the instructor, around this idea of evaluating and revising your discussions in an online course, um, if this is something that you're looking to engage. And absolutely, feel free to share, share that handout, absolutely. Uh, um, uh, you can see in this, uh, you could use this graphic org organizer, sorry, to capture all of the discussion prompts in a particular course, to examine which ones might want to warrant revision, as well as other changes that I might want to make uh, to its structure, right? I, I included a space to capture the module objective uh, that's associated with the activity. 
uh, and a space to capture the changes that might work. So you sort of start with, here's my initial discussion prompt, here's my objective, you know, sort of identifying, is this one that I want to revise? And then, okay, if I'm actually going to try my hand at revising this, this is a place where I can capture the revision uh, that I want to make to the discussion prompt. Um, there is uh, under these additional considerations here, there's a prompt under additional considerations to reflect on whether discussion roles would be appropriate for this discussion. Uh, would a video format be uh, appropriate for the discussion? And quick note here, um, I've worked with instructors who've wanted to shift away from the use of traditional discussion boards and basically wanted to transfer all of the discussion questions from their online course into a video format on Flip. And in my experience, not all questions translate well into this format. Not all questions are good at video discussion, right? Questions that are heavily reliant on students justifying an answer from a text or a textbook don't lend themselves well to a video discussion. So, so my point is that here in this, in, this, uh, in this graphic organizer, you can reflect on whether this question would be appropriate for a video format. You might also reflect on whether perusal platform would be appropriate space uh, in, uh, for this discussion. Uh, that it, in the module, module objective, you know, I think uh, perusal would be a consideration for those discussion prompts that rely on, have, rely heavily on students' interaction with a single text that is open and available in an electronic format. So maybe this is, maybe I just want to sort of scrap the, the discussion prompt all together and go to focusing on perusal within, uh, you know, annotating on a particular text. But anyway, I offer this resource as something that might be meaningful and beneficial as a template to engage in reflection with faculty members uh, about potential revision to their online discussion, all right? And so with that in mind, that is, I think I'm about on the right time, wrapping up a few minutes in time for, for some questions that wraps up my presentation here. Um, and I'll sort of open it up if those of you have questions uh, that you want to uh, have addressed, you feel free to drop those in the in the chat. I think some of the earlier questions I think we addressed. Mm -hmm.